next guest has two Oscars and served over 20 years in the British Parliament. She's now nominated for a Tony. Please welcome Glenda Jackson. Well, welcome to the Ed Sullivan Theater. Well, they told me about the dome. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It, we get to change it every day. It's all digital projection. Oh no! Yeah, it was it was covered over for for many many years from, from like the 1970s until just My recently. Gosh. It was a beautiful 1927 theater. And so someone was telling me. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, nice to have uh, a star of stage and screen here. Um, you, as I said before, you've got uh, you have two Oscars. You have a long and storied acting career, but. It wasn't as long as some people would have wanted because in 1992, mm -hmm. you stood for a member of parliament and you were elected and, and served for 23 years. Why did you want to go from acting or from show business into politics? Because my country is being destroyed by Margaret Thatcher. I'm a supporter of, a member of the Labour Party. Oh, yes! Ah, ah. And, um, Not a fan. Well... Not a fan of Margaret Thatcher. Everything... Right? Anything I could have done that was legal to get her out of office and her government, I was prepared to have a go at. I had been working more publicly for the Labour Party from about the mid-70s. I was never quite sure whether I became a face you could put a name to or a name you could put a face to. But I was sent out and campaigned in the elections from 79 in marginal seats, none of which we won. But anyway, um, I think the clincher for me was when she said there was no such thing as a society. And even though I'd seen my country being destroyed, everything I'd been taught as a child to regard as vices, she told me were virtues. Greed wasn't greed, it was a doubt it's independence. Selfishness wasn't selfishness, it was taking care of yourself and your family. And, you know, a friend of mine, an artist, came back from the centre of London one day, and he said to me, London is now a city that Hogarth would recognise. And he would have recognised it because every single shop doorway, not only in London, but across the whole of the country, at night was the bedroom, bathroom, living room of some poor homeless person, not unusually also suffering from mental illness because she had closed all the long-stay mental homes for something called care in the community. They were in the community. There was marked lack of care. So anything I could have done, I was prepared to do. I didn't expect to win. I didn't even expect to be selected in the first instance, because, you know, that's a decision for the individual constituency party. I'm very proud of the fact that the four of us who were the final runners were all women, even before we as a Labour Party insisted that in marginal seats, the, you know, the, there should be all women shortlists. Um, and we, I think, thought up until... Well, I certainly thought up until the Monday when we actually went to the polls that we were going to form a government, but we didn't. But we did in 97. And, as I said, you were there for 23 years. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had the American actress Cynthia Nixon oh, on here. Oh, I've worked about with a, Cynthia. About a month ago, yeah. and I said, do, do you think that... Um, wh why would you want to go into politics? You're known as an actress. Do you think that running for you know, governor of the state of New York is maybe the first job you should go for? And she pointed to you as an example of people who have to answer the call, people who had made their trade in acting but saw that there was a need for their voice or to represent the ideals of certain people in politics. Do you miss it now? Well, I... I, I... I question what you just said, that our voices should be heard in politics in that sense, as though the theatre, people who work in the theatre, are separate entities, almost like extraterrestrials. We're not. Um, well, we, I meant the people that she said, the people that they, they well, represent. Well, the people you represent are certainly in that level, yes, because one of the most humbling things about being a member of Parliament, and it is also a privilege, let's not get away from it, but one of the most humbling things was, for me, well, I think for all members of Parliament, we hold what we call advice surgeries. And anyone in your constituency can come to that advice surgery with whatever their problem is. And they're coming to you because you were the port of last resort. Everything else that they've done to try and improve what in many instances are absolutely unbelievable dental lives have failed. And you didn't always get the result that they wanted. But you always got a reply to your letter. You always got your telephone call returned. And without exception, 
whether you'd achieved what the individual constituency, constituent wanted or not. They said, thank you. And that is a truly humbling experience, as is the realisation that those people put an X next to your party. I mean, that is our most precious right, it seems to me, the right to vote. And for someone to actually put their trust in you. Yeah, absolutely. 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 You know. Well, now you've returned to the stage. Yep. And uh, first, you played uh, Lear at the Old Vic. Yes, I did. Right there. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you carry Cordelia on? <laughs> I, what we did was I envisioned, we envisioned, she is hung and cutting her down, which he purportedly does. Yeah, she's hanged, technically. Yes, she's hanged. She's hanged. So, okay. <laughs> What's the difference? Don't mean to teach the British their language, but go ahead. Why not? <laughs> Try! Try! You can't spell theatre properly. <laughs> Bravo! Bravo! Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm holding Cordelia and we're dragged on on a rug. As oh, got it. You know, Lee had cut her down and... Wouldn't let her go, so that's how we managed that. Well, now at the Golden Theatre here in New York, you're doing Edward Albee, the great American dramatist's Three Tall Women. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the story of Three Tall Women? It's the story of a woman, actually, presented in three different timescales. Mm -hmm. And it's based, he's very open about it, it's based in the main on his relationship with his adoptive mother. Oh. And that seems to have been a pretty tormented relationship. He was very open about that. Mm -hmm. He's written at the frontispiece of the copy of the play that we've worked on, I'm paraphrasing this, yeah. um, the last three sentences. And he says, I never during her lifetime met anyone who liked her. I've never met anyone who saw the play who disliked her. What have I done? Happy Mother's Day. Exactly. exactly. Glenda, thank you so much for being here. Thank Lovely you. to meet you. You can see her in Three Tall Women on Broadway at the Golden Theater and at the Tony Awards June 10th on CBS. Glenda Jackson, everybody. We'll be right back with author Michael Pollan.